every so often, every few months, just do a check-in to what you're actually spending on. It's one of those things that we always have to make sure that you're aware of where your money is going. Don't pay yourself way more than you need to. Good morning. My name is Jenny Woon. I'm Tony Singh. Welcome back to In the House podcast. We have a guest in the house, Mike Molika. Welcome to our show. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, ladies. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thanks for coming on. You are the founder and senior advisor of MGM Financial. What does MGM stand for? Uh, MGM actually is uh, nothing fancy, just my initials, actually. So oh. You know, when I was um, went out independently and, and started my my practice, I worked with a, a branding specialist, and we went through different names. And then he did a play with my initials, and he kind of thought, you know, the way it designed, the way it was designed with the three uh, three letters, kind of represented the three areas of our business mm -hmm. and what we do. So he kind of made it look really good, and we just kind of stuck with it and went with it. So. Okay. Okay. That's all it is. <laughs> but you also not just MGM. You have a lot of initials after your name. I do. CFP, CLU, CIM, CCS, FEA. I feel like I'm rapping here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what mine is? MOM. You want to know what that stands for? I know what it stands for. Tell the audience. <laughs> Master of mul Multitasking. <laughs> it's I'm true. not proud of that initial. No, but, but you are. You are. I know, but it's bad. Bad to multitask. So you have what this means is you're a very smart guy, Mike. <laughs> You've got yeah. a lot of designations. Uh, yeah, or or like to pay for school, one or the other. But um, but yeah, I know it's you know one of the things that I I thought was important to me when I you know I used to work for a larger institution and when I went kind of on my own, I thought it was important to you know get the foundation foundation of knowledge which I had in a in a corporate finance diploma that I received, but also these designations that are for my industry specifically. And I thought that was important as I carried on in my business. I mean, most of these I got many years mm -hmm. ago, but. Mm -hmm. As I started on this journey and, and, and creating and building up what we, what we have today, is it was kind of a focus early on in my career. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I don't want to undermine, like you're accumulating all these acronyms, but they all have a high degree of responsibility to your clients. So let's give a, I know you've already given us a little bit of introduction, mm -hmm. but let's talk about what you've been doing over the past 20 years. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I started my career in financial services about 20 years ago and uh, started in the banking world. So I, I learned, you know, the fundamentals of how the banking system works, which was great. Uh, realized that it uh, wasn't a place I wanted to stay forever. So I learned my stuff and then I moved on to another institution. There I learned more about the wealth management side, which was really, really good. Uh, worked with a great team of people. And at the time, um, I came to a head where I was, I was getting kind of bored in the role I was in and I wanted to expand and, and grow within either the team that I was working with or within the firm. And I didn't have an opportunity to do so where I was. So, you know, after some long discussions with myself, I decided, you know, it's probably time to, to make a move. Mm -hmm. And the option was to go somewhere else or try to give it a go on my own. And talking to some of my colleagues that were kind of already independent, they said, you know, give it a go on your own. And if it works great, and if not, you can always go back. And I was like, eh, you know, why not? It was, I was young enough. And I figured, you know, now's the time to take the chance. And, and, you know, I did. And, you know, the first couple, couple of few years was challenging to say the least, just like any small business owner, entrepreneur, um, you know, it's tough. I mean, no, no matter what business you're in. And then, you know, as things started, um, as time progressed on, things started to get easier, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. instead of me, running around the, the whole city and making calls like crazy every day. People were starting to call me back, which was kind of nice. Mm -hmm. So as, as things progressed on, um, got busier, uh, my team, you know, I hired my first person, um, built my first office mm -hmm. and, you know, the team expanded over, over time. And today we have a team of seven of us. Amazing. So it's small, still, a, you know, a boutique planning firm. Um, but we still do, uh, all sorts of different things from some basic planning to more complex tax strategies and things like that. So, and we're continuing to grow and we're continuing to partner with uh, advisors and associates uh, all the time. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So Mike, how can realtors benefit from 
partnering with a financial and insurance planner or with you guys? <laughs> yeah, no, great question. So for us, um, we're almost like an extension of your team. So no different than having a um, home inspector or a mortgage broker. Um, you know, those are the people you probably refer to on a regular basis or someone who helps uh, with the conveyancing of your businesses or, you know, things like that. You know, people engage with us and specifically real estate professionals um, when they want, let's just say, for example, you, you're working for the, with a first-time home buyer and they maybe just don't have enough yet to purchase that first-time home. Well, we can use various strategies to help them do that mm -hmm. or educate them on areas where they can get money to do that. So is, is it using a tool like your RSP as a first-time home buyer? You can draw it out. Uh, the federal government recently announced this program, which is a first-time home buyer savings plan, which is something that came uh, came to light in April first of this year. Uh, we're still working through the parameters of, of what the paperwork looks like, work looks like but the, essentially, it's like a uh, RSP hybrid, or RSP and TFSC hybrid kind of product, where you can put money in, you get the deduction, and when you pull it out, you don't have mm -hmm. to pay it back. Mm -hmm. So, we can help with strategies to help people save for their purchase of a home. On the other side of the fence, so let's just say, for example, now realtor is looking for some help with a client that has, you know, maybe multiple properties. And we're talking maybe it's an estate sale or dealing with, you know, some sort of tax issue. So you would engage in someone like myself, or my team, or any sort of financial professional to help with, okay, what does that look like on the tax side of things? So we would engage our, our tax partners to help with that. Um, also, let's just say, for example, they do sell and they have this lump sum of money. Now what? You know, is it, do we want to distribute that to other generations? Do we need this money for some sort of retirement replacement or income? So I can help with all sorts of things. So mm -hmm. essentially what the financial professional should be doing when it comes to working with your, the realtors or, I mean, their teams or the clients they work with, is just another extension of their, mm -hmm. you know, a team mm -hmm. member or referral partner, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. yeah. How important is it to have the right like insurance coverage as a real estate professional? I'm not talking about like car insurance or anything like that, but <laughs> life insurance, disability insurance, because um, that cost of opportunity, like you were investing, I guess, a monthly premium is what yep. you call it. And at the end of the day, like what would be the difference if I like was to maybe just save money every month to myself and not put it into a plan like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. So there's a few different types of strategies that we employ when it comes to that one is you know most realtors are self-employed or i think pretty much all of them are except i think you mentioned something about some people are uh employees but predominantly most of them are self-employed so um you live breathe and die um your business and if something happens to you not only the fact of you know god forbid something happens to you where you pass on uh, but let's just say you can't work and you can't generate income or you can't go in and meet your clients. So we need to find some sort of way to replace your income or some sort of income replacement program. Mm -hmm. so that's first and foremost, because that is our, well, as a realtor, your most, I don't say your prized possession, but your, the thing that you, um, your, your income potential is limitless, really. So if we have something that happen, that happens to you that limits that ability to earn, we need to protect that mm -hmm. first and foremost. Um, and that can be done through a couple of different types of products or different strategies when it comes to income replacement, critical illness type coverage, like if you get sick. Mm -hmm. um, the second is, you know, another common uh, type of coverage is, is life insurance, really. I mean, if um, it may, may not seem as important if you're an individual with no spouse or children or other sort of, um, you know, family responsibilities. But if you do have those family responsibilities, it's, it's you're doing your due diligence not only to yourself, but also your family. So I think that's important. <clears throat> But also if you have team members, let's just say you you manage a team and you are the, you know, you're the person that drives that that engine. God forbid something happens to you. Well, now you have maybe a team of five, 10, 20 that like, oh, the, the person who is driving the bus is no longer here. Mm -hmm. So how is our business? How's your brand? How's your legacy going to be left with, you know, you not being there, being the driver of this? So mm -hmm. it's important to understand, I mean, when it comes to insurance, I mean, people, people just people think they pay for insurance for, oh, like, just protect me for X, Y, Z. And, you know, I think we all feel we could pay enough, you know, your car, your house, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so I think when you have coverage as a, for a real estate professional, it just depends. You have to kind of know what the reason is for. Right. And then that kind of, when you do that, then you can align the right product or strategy with whatever your goals and objectives are. Right. Mm -hmm. So 
Mike, as you know, in the real estate industry, um, as you say, most of us are self-employed. The <laughs> It's uh, cyclical as well, the markets. They always mm-hmm. go up and they always go down. There's a lot of ebb and flow. Um, as a financial planner, how can you, there's, there's two specific things I think that come up for a lot of realtors. Number one is how can a financial planner help with um, helping find a solution to purchase a home? Mm-hmm. And the second part of that would be how can a financial planner help with retirement? Because often people don't put enough away. Yeah, no, great question. So, I mean, for for that, I mean, you know, when I always start, we have a we have a process when anyone sits down with us, and regardless if you're a real estate professional or anyone else for that matter, uh, we always wanted to look at what comes in, what goes out. And I always start every conversation with a kind of cash flow plan, and and simply put, it's money in, money out. Mm-hmm. And what we want to look at is let's determine what's going on here with your affairs, and then let's figure out what's important to you. Um, you know, I find that too many, uh, too many times I come across people where they do things when it comes to savings plans without any sort of goals or objectives. There's no r- real reason behind it. So, you know, when it comes to, if, if the goal is to buy a home or any sort of other sort of, you know, if it is retirement or whatever the case may be, we have to have actually a layout plan. Just like you, we want everyone, you know, as, as a realtor or whomever, you, you plan, certain strategies when you want to sell or buy a property. Okay. I'm going to look at a certain area. I'm looking for a certain number or budget. We need a certain amount of space. You know, on the financial planning side of things, it it acts very similar where, you know, let's figure out what we have and let's figure out what we want and let's kind of build a plan to get there. You know, Mm -hmm. instead of, let's just say someone says, I'm looking for a house in Vancouver. It doesn't really tell us much, right? Mm -hmm. So someone says, I want to retire. Okay. What does that look like? What does retirement look like? When? How much do you need? What are you going to be doing in that retirement? And then we kind of work backwards. So if someone says to me, you know, I've had this conversation or someone many times where someone asks, what's, what's, what's my number? I'm like, what does that mean? I mean, what do you mean? What's your number? It's like, what do I need to have to retire? I'm like, well, that's different for all three of us and anyone else who's, who's listening or watching is because what does that look like? You know, are we retiring and, and we're going to be sitting um, you know, debt free and and we're not gonna you know we're not gonna have any hobbies or we're not gonna go on vacations or anything like that. Well, that number is gonna be a bit, very different than yeah. someone who wants to golf every day and go on extravagant vacations and you know live half the year somewhere else or whatever. So, I think when it comes down to it, is that we help kind of lay out a plan to get you to where you want to go. I think that's the biggest key and the biggest thing that we help with is. Aside from the different strategies and products that we can offer to help you get there, it's more about let's have that conversation to see what is it that we're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. And what I often find that most real estate agents, um, what they do is they see it as one transaction and then maybe five years from now they see one transaction again, buy, sell, whatever it is. So helping and building the plan, can you help us as real estate agents how to incorporate that conversation so that you we bring you into the picture? We actually also benefit because they're going to continuously invest into mm-hmm. more real estate assets and how we can work together so that we, we're building them a portfolio rather than just individual transactions. Mm-hmm. Of course, yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, when we're reviewing um, you know people's plans, I mean, the idea for us is to continue to build net worth or grow net worth over time. So how do we do that? And if, if we're looking at real estate specifically, I mean, people buy real estate for a couple of different reasons or a few different reasons, I should say. One is um, you need a place to live, right? That's most common and, and most often. Second is that now we want to invest in real estate, right? And investing in real estate, there's usually two objectives. It's either cash flow or capital appreciation, sometimes both, right? And you know, as well as I do, that certain markets, it's hard to get both uh, and certain markets, you can get both. So I think having that laid out, having that plan laid out is something that helps us to kind of determine what that looks like. You know, if we buy our first property or how do we do that? Okay. And then how do we get our second? What does that look like? So we are we trying to accumulate um, condos? Are we trying to accumulate single family dwellings? Are we trying to go commercial? So what does that look like? And then actually putting a strategy together to start saving that. You know, are we going to assume, uh, I mean, we've been very fortunate in the lower mean in the last 20 years that we've had appreciation quite dramatically. So most of the people who are buying their second, third, fourth, five, fifth properties and so on, they're leveraging from the, the value that's been created in their properties going up, which is great. Um, which is stimulate a lot of different things, which I think that's a good strategy, but you have to understand that and plan that. So it doesn't, you know, not all, you know, I mean, who knows how, what are, what's going to go on in the next, you know, one, three, five, ten 10 years, but let's, let's hope things do continue to appreciate in value, but we don't know what that looks like. You know, are we going to have the same robust growth 
the next 20 years than we just had in the last 20? Who knows, right? So I think that's more just about planning and just having that honest conversation and what your goals and objectives are. Right. How can realtors help their clients protect their investment through insurance products, um, such as homeowners insurance or, I don't know, mortgage life insurance? Yeah. Um, so in that respect, just like, you know, people protect, um, you know, their vehicles when it comes to, hey, you know, I have to get, I mean, by law, we have to have some sort of covers like ICBC to put our car on the road. You know, the, the homes or any, a home or any sort of property, usually it's our largest asset. So, I mean, at, at the end of the day, we want to make sure we protect that largest asset. And regardless if you're, you know, a single individual or um, have family with other you know, other responsibilities, you want to make sure that's protected. And there's a couple of different ways you do that. One is, you know, obviously covering your home. Uh, God forbid something happens, fire, flood, theft, things like that. Uh, and second is that if there is debt on that home, you know, m more often than not, people do have some sort of mortgage at uh, some sort of uh, range liability. and liability and things like that. So when it comes to the, the mortgage or life insurance, I mean, again, looking at that, regardless of something, you know, if something happens to the individual, we want to make sure that that asset is protected. So, you know, if, if let's just the typical, or let's say a case would be maybe two two spouses or, or, or partners are, are, are buying this property and there's some sort of debt covenant against it. If something happens to the one individual that was supporting that payment, um, you're going to add stress to the other person left. Yep. Regardless if you're, you know, yeah. have children or no children on your own, whatever the case may be. So what insurance mm -hmm. does, specifically mortgage and life insurance and things along those lines, is it just gives you that peace of mind to say, if something happens to me, you're good, you know, and vice versa. Um, so that's, I think, very important to to have. And again, I think regardless of the situation, it's something that everyone should look at. And if it's uh, if it's necessary needed, then you should have. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm sure you service quite a wide range of mm -hmm. clients from retirement to maybe pe people buying their first home. Um, give us a scenario where you've worked with a real estate agent as a client and how you kind of planned out their financial, like kind of future. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so I, I work with a number of realtors and, you know, various, some of them are uh, set up where they're just a sole proprietor. Some have their prex, some have prex and holding companies and things like that. So I think more often than not, when I come across a, a realtor and, and I talk to them for the first time, things are a bit of, things are all over the place. I'll be honest. Um, they're common. And, you know, they think they've done either a, a good job of planning their personal stuff, uh, maybe a good job of planning their um, corporate stuff. Very rarely they've done a good job of both. But also, and I'm just being honest, um, and, and also just there there are other professionals that they've spoken to. And specifically, I'm just I'm going to pick on accountants for a second. There's not a lot of planning that's put into place. Mm -hmm, you yeah. know, I think for real estate professionals, you, you do have, you know, higher expenses. And it's more about how do you structure things to make sure that you're tax efficient. And mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I like, or that I do, I should say, is that I want to keep m the most amount of money in your pocket as possible. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? Well, let's use strategies that exist to make sense for you in your scenario. So, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. This, this realtor came to me and he was recently, um, recently became part of a team. And part of that was, you know, setting up his own prec and he was earning a good income Personally, even he's realizing, man, I'm paying this ridiculous amount of tax because, you know, you're getting taxed at the highest rates on, you know, he's earning a substantial sum. So he set up this prec and he's doing all these things. So there's a bit of a transition here. So I helped him get organized in that respect and using the various tools and strategies to help mitigate his tax bill. And as we went on, it's like, okay, well, now what? You know, I'm still, gen now I'm generating even more money, but now it's flowing through this, this prec strategy and I still want to invest in a certain ways. So you know, I worked with his account with his account to set up like a holding structure to make sure that we're setting up another vehicle and so on and so forth. So, you know, I guess it really depends on where you're at with uh, your business and where you want to go with it. But I can help, you know, from someone starting off to someone who's at a, a different stage. And, you know, we use various tools and strategies to help with whatever stage you're at, but also making sure your goals and objectives are met when it comes to if you're looking to potentially retire as a realtor, as, as we all know that, um, you know, it's a commission sales driven role or, or business or profession. So, you know, you have to be thinking about saving along the way, because if you're not selling, you're not earning. And if you didn't save, then you're going to continue to work for a long, longer than probably you should. Yeah. Right. So what I do is I make sure and I encourage people to make sure that they think about that mm -hmm. is that while your income is substantial and, you know, you know, so, I mean, you guys probably know many people that are earning seven figures plus. 
yeah, that's a gener- that's a very, very good income. And, you know, a lot of people aren't saving a lot of that money because of whatever the case may be. So I help them put them, I put them on a path, say, less than much we say, save for a rainy day, for a cyclical market where, you know, you go through, you know, 2022 where things aren't as um, certain with everything going on with interest rates and everything else. Now things look a little bit better, but, you know, who knows, well, who knows <laughs> right? It wasn't like the heydays of, you know, into 2020 and 2021 where things are going crazy, mm-hmm. right? So, and a lot of people don't think that far ahead. So what we help them with is kind of giving, uh, having a more of a realistic conversation what that looks like in good times and as bad, but also in good times and in bad, but also what we do when it comes to structuring um, your affairs to make sure that they achieve your objective. Because, you know, I know some, you talked about burnout, right? You guys have talked about burnout that, you know, you go hard, hard, hard for many, many years. But imagine if you didn't save any money or didn't plan for that rainy day. You'd be forced to continue work. to work because this is what you do because you need to eat, you need to su- support and so on and so forth. But if you have a, you know, other properties and rental properties or another pot of, of resources that you can draw from, um, if things do, um, you get tired or you just need a break, then you can basically draw from that if, if you have the right types of plan in place. Mm-hmm. So. Can you give us like exactly how, what percentage of taxes they saved and also how much more they built in savings? Yeah, great question. This so, particular yeah, so I'll go with that. So, I mean, he was generating, he was generating on his own about 400,000. Uh, and then when he became part of this team, his, he bumped up to about five, like in the five. So, you know, healthy income. Um, but once he set up the prec, I mean, again, the, I, I don't know the exact tax figures and his account would have that, but so now we have money flowing through this, this strategy, this prec. And, and what happens is that you're getting taxed at your corporate tax rates, which is substantially better. Um, so he was paying himself, you know, if you think about three, three fifty um, regular income, you know, the, the lot of like 220 up, you're getting taxed at 50, mm-hmm. almost 54%. Yeah. So half the money or more than half the money you're earning is going to taxes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So again, he didn't need that to live. He's like, well, I need, he needed, you know, I think his number was like 11,000 a month or something to live personally for all his family stuff. He had a few young kids and everything else. And he was the one who was generating most of, of the income for the household. So I'm saying, well, why do you, you don't, you don't need to pay yourself all this money, mm-hmm. right? So from just doing that, that prex, setting up that prec and then setting up the holding company to roll over the money from the prec to the hold co., he was able to redirect money into this tax efficient vehicle without having to pay any more tax. Got it. Pay tax in the prec, mm-hmm. pay tax on the money you pay personally, but money moved from the prec to the hold code, there's no tax because it's considered an intercompany dividend. So this was my next question for yeah. you. So perfect. Um, and it might be hard to answer, but in your opinion then, because um, I understand that prex should not be used for uh, holding, yep. right? So at What's the figure then where you would recommend someone open a hold co? Great question. Yeah. So for that, I mean, there's 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 two things. One is um, income and going back to cash flow, income expenses, right? So if you say, well, I generate um, 150 thousand of revenue and I need 130 to live, there's no point. That's right. There's no point. So if you can save, if you're saving or you can save, you know, fifty thousand plus a year annually then it makes sense to set up the the holding company mm-hmm. because every year you have to file that taxes for the holding company and things like that it's about like five thousand to set up to right for legal and accounting costs yeah and then that's ongoing accounting costs right and then mm-hmm. legal to keep it active and everything else so again you have to make sure that you're putting money into the structure to make it make sense mm-hmm. yeah Sorry, i have another question go ahead mm-hmm. so then let's just fast forward and pretend yep. we have a hold co yep um at what phase would you recommend, I mean, multiple hold codes or one hold co? What phase would someone be at before they actually open a family trust? Well, again, that really depends on the scenario, yeah. right? I mean, that's, I mean, the, the trusts aren't as tax efficient as they once were because mm-hmm. there's different rules. I mean, again, for that, that's more mainly when I would, you know, engage an accountant or one of their own accounting partners or one of those that I work with and say, well, does this make, does this structure make sense? Um, because the trusts, there's, they're a bit of a different animal and they cost more money, cost more money to maintain. And there's gotta be, there's different rules with that. There's some called a 21 year rule where, you know, there's deemed disposition of assets after 21 years and things like that. So, you know, there's gotta be specific things in there to, um, put in, to make, make, to, for them to make sense. So, you know, I've had clients where, you know, they've had one rental property set up all these structures and it was just a headache and a waste of time, frankly. 
And we're now looking at ways to unwind that because it doesn't make sense, right? So that's one thing to keep in mind too. If you do own any sort of rental property in a corporation, the rental income that is generated, like the net rental is actually taxed at the highest, uh, uh, sorry, it's taxed at passive income rates, which is over 50%. Right. Yeah. So you're getting taxed at a higher rate just to receive that. So again, if it's one property, is it necessary to be in a company? Probably not. There's other vehicles that you can utilize. So mm -hmm. again, looking at the various strategies that, that exist. And yeah, no, thank you for answering that because I know everyone's scenario is different. So yeah. it's, it's hard to answer. Yeah. What about for newer realtors or realtors that are just starting to think about, you know, their financial planning and insurance needs? What kind of advice would you give to, to that demographic of realtor? Yeah, for that, I, you know, what I would do is go back and just keep track of things. Um, I think that's the best plan of attack is that, you know, you're going to be generating, you know, large commissions um, and it's going to get exciting. You're going to get some big checks and you're going to excite them and buy things and you're going to get excited. And that's just, just reality. But what I would always do, especially when you start off, I'd probably put aside at least 25% into some sort of account to account for taxes. Because uh, that tax bill comes hard and fast. And especially if you've had a good year and you didn't plan for it and you have to write a big check, they'll be like, oh crap, you know, this is, I wasn't ready for this. So I think that's always a good thing. I think I mean, I'm a, I'm a spreadsheet guy because that's just what I've been doing for a long time. But I, I would encourage any of them to to track what what comes in, what goes out. And you know, I, you know, I was a realtor that you do have a number of expenses, marketing, and you're doing a lot of lunches, dinners, things like that, coffees. So just keep track of, of things as best as possible. So either you can get various applications for that to help. Um, you can again use a simple spreadsheet. And I think the more organized you are from the onset, the better you'll be in the end. Um, and that's just will help uh, when it comes to everything, when it comes to your accounting, when it comes to working with, you know, professionals like myself and going to the insurance aspect of things, it's just protection. Again, going back to, you want to protect yourself because if you can't, if you can't earn, um, because of one reason or another, like, you know, injury or, or, or illness, then what do you, and then, then you're kind of hooped really at yeah. the end of the day. So what are some myths, uh, about <laughs> financial planners or advisors uh, myths that, like that this icks you that that are not true uh, well that's a good question yeah so i think you know when someone says oh i talked to my banker and it's kind of irritates me because i mean that's very different i mean i think mm -hmm. the industry just like i think any industry or any professional services industry you have some good you have some bad and you have some indifferent right um so i think some advisors in, in the past uh, we're able to do things that are really un not allowed anymore. And when it comes to the way they charged for their services or how they set up the investment plans or um, things like that. Um, so that's one thing that kind of irks me. And you look at certain aspects of how a lot of our compliance and things that we have to do today are because of some bad apples, right? I'm sure that's within in any industry. Um, so I think we're all definitely not painted with the same brush. Um, you know, we're independent. So what that basically means, we're not tied to any sort of institution dictating what we do. You know, when I used to work for the bank, I can only do what the bank told me I can do. So there is quite a bit of difference when it comes to working with an independent advisor to someone who is employed by the, an institution and can only do what is offered by the institution. So uh, we are very different in that respect. I mean, you can use almost an analogy of like a mortgage broker. You have a mortgage broker who works for a bank, can only do the bank stuff. And you have the independents who have access to everything. So, um, but yeah, I think that's really it. I think we are definitely not all built the same. And I think if you are working with, and if you are working with someone and, and if whoever is listening that is looking for a financial planner, do your due diligence, make sure they do have certain credentials because it's important. All those letters that you mentioned earlier behind my name, those cost me money every year to renew. There's <laughs> Canadian education credits. <laughs> Like there's, there's ongoing stuff I have to do every single year for every single one of those things wow. mm -hmm. to keep it active, to keep it current. And it costs money to do so in time. So mm -hmm. you want to work with someone who's actually actively in the business and not just sitting there saying, I do this, even though I don't really actually do anything. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So that's important. Okay. So don't ever call Mike a banker. Yeah. <laughs> no, definitely okay. not. Different that's okay. That's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Mike, can you explain the differences um, that exist between personal and business planning strategies for real estate professionals? Yeah, I kind of touched on that a little bit um, when it comes to, you know, being a sole proprietor or having, you know, a structure like a, 
you know, Prex and, and holding companies and whatnot. I think really at the end of the day, the main difference is about how um, you operate your your business. And, you know, are you a sole proprietor? Do you have everything in your own personal name? Are you a part of a team? Are you the team? Um, and then how do you structure your affairs? And, you know, do you pay yourself, um, you know, T, uh, T4s? Do you pay yourself dividends? Things like that. So um, I've worked with a number of different, um, again, realtors, and, and they're set up very differently. And again, just depends on what, what it is that they're, um, doing and what how they're set up for themselves and essentially really um so yeah i mean i guess at the end of the day every situation is different and every um realtor is different when it comes to that mm-hmm. what are some of the like i guess common mistakes that we do as realtors when it comes to you're probably like when you see our finances you're like this is a <laughs> mess like what's very common with us so a couple things. One, I think most realtors pay themselves too much money. Oh, okay. okay. So you pay yourself too much money because personally. Because we live beyond the, our means. <laughs> well, it's not even that. It's just like you pay yourself personally too much money that you don't need. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So you're paying. And you're necessary. paying a higher tax bracket. You got it. Yeah. Right. And that's what comes comes to the structure, right? Like especially people who have these structures in place, right? Mm-hmm. So you have your your prec in place. You have your hold code. And now you have yourself personally, and then you're paying yourself from your prec. I don't know. Call it three hundred thousand a year, but you really only need a hundred. Yeah, you're paying tax. You're paying an extra two hundred thousand on that extra on that hundred and one thousand to three hundred thousand. You're paying unnecessary tax, and you don't need to. Yeah, right. Unless you're doing some, you know, going to an RSP, and there's all that we can talk about things like that. But again, if you have all these structures in place, why don't you just redirect it to your holding company or in your prac? There's other things you can do that you don't need to just pull it out personally just to pay tax. Right. So I think that's probably the most common thing. Um, the second thing is probably they spend too much money. <laughs> and, and they just and, and they just don't know where it's going. Frankly, like it's just, and that's why I think tracking is important, right? Yeah, I mean, right. obviously, when you're earning good income, I mean, we spend a little bit more. I and mean, as your income goes up, you're going to spend a little bit more on things. You're not going to maybe think twice about certain things. So I always find it's important every so often, every few months, every six months, to just do a check in, you know, to what you're actually spending on, regardless if it's like personal subscriptions to things or. <laughs> Or mm, business sure. things. Right? Those but, add up. But really it does. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of it. I mean, I, I have to do a check-in myself all the time, but it's one of those things that we always have to make sure that, you know, you're aware of where your money is going. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, the biggest key is that, you know, just be conscious of what you're spending and then don't pay yourself way more than you need to. I'm assuming a part of your role is being a therapist because like, like us, <laughs> like we're retail, like retail therapy. If we yeah. were like feeling down yeah. or mm-hmm. even uh social comparison, Oh, this person just bought a, yeah. a watch. I got to go get a, this, a better watch now, yeah. you know? So a lot of it is more than just financial advice. Course. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, 100%. It's funny because I, I've, I've go, I, 2020, 2022 was a challenging year for all of us. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and on the investment side of things and the investment side of my business, um, markets were the greatest. And it's funny because 2021 markets are really good. And, you know, obviously I'm, I'm reviewing with clients and having conversations on a regular basis, but they were good conversations. They were happy conversations. Come 2022, people have almost forget what happened. It's like, Hey, you know, markets don't go up, up every year consistently, right? There's going to have some up days and, and, and up days and up years and, and down. But it's funny because I had this conversation with someone like, I feel like I'm a counselor. I'm a doctor and a counselor every single day. I'm a doctor trying to solve problems and fix situations. Then I'm a counselor trying to talk people off the ledge. (laughs) We do the same thing, Mike. But seriously, that's what it's like. Because for me, it's like, well, you know, you don't need this money for 15 or 20 years. Yes, we're conscious of what's going on in the marketplace. But you're not alone. We all are. Mm -hmm. You know, I said people, I'm I'm happy to share share with you what my portfolio is doing. It's a lot worse than yours because I have more risk, right? Yeah. But I, and I share that. And I said, listen, guys, I mean, I'm a long-term investor. Mm-hmm. Just like you are when we sat down and we went through your goals and objectives, right? Mm-hmm. So if you told me I needed this money in six months or a year from now, we would have adjusted accordingly. We wouldn't have put your money to, to work, right? Mm-hmm. Um, just like if someone's buying real estate. Oh, I need this money out of this house in a year. Well, you know, or I'm trying to flip this thing. Well, it's, markets aren't, you, you can't time it. And you can't yeah. predict what's going to happen in the future. Right. And it's one of those things where you always have to look at what are we doing this for? And if the goal is further, you know, a longer term goal, a shorter term goal, we have to make sure we're adjusting things accordingly. Right. You know, when someone gets a note of assessment and it's down more than what they paid for the house, are they calling you and panicking? What? Hey, what, what do you mean? I bought this thing for one five. My assessment says one three. 
mm-hmm. what's up? Yeah. No different than me. It's just the, the challenge is you're getting a statement every quarter from me. And if it's down one quarter, they're like, what happened? It's a, yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, it's just like in their face, right? So it's one of those things that we have to go back to the reason why we're doing things. And that's kind of, um, so yes, it is. There's a lot of talking people off the ledge. And especially so from, you know, last year from June till the end of the year. <laughs> But we survived. And, you know, it's funny because now things have turned around and people are, are happy again. And, I need to talk to you. And it's just one of those things. It's just the cycle. I've been doing it long enough, so I understand how it all works. But it's definitely some, <laughs> uh, for, it definitely calls for some trying days. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So. Mm-hmm. We are almost at the top of the hour. It's gone by so fast. And we always round out with uh, five rapid fire questions. Are you ready, Mike? <sighs> Pressure. Yeah, I'm good. Let's go. <laughs> okay, Let's right. do this. Question one. If you were not a financial planner, what career would you be in? Like by choice or like if I had to pick anything? Any, you could pick anything. Anything. World's like, your oyster. I would like to replace Guy Fieri on di- Diners, Drivers, and Dives. Oh, no way. What? Okay. That's, what okay. That's interesting. Yeah. I like that. That's okay. I like food and I like to cook and I would love that job. What's your favorite meal to cook? Oof. I like... I added the sixth question. Um, I'm a... I'm a, I'm a I like pasta. I mean, an Italian guy. It's something I grew up with my whole life. Yeah. So okay. there's a few different versions of it I like, but. You should cook for Jenny. She doesn't know how to cook. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. I'm just saying. I, I'm just I saying. I do nourish bowls now. Yes. Okay. Okay, okay. okay. That's healthy. Next question. Yeah. Sounds fancy. <laughs> What's uh, your all-time favorite movie about money and finance? Ooh. Oh, uh, why can't I think of it off the hat? Wall Street. I was, that's what I was going to say. Wolf Wall, of Wall Street. Wolf, Wolf, you know, it's, Wolf that's Wall actually, it, Wolf of Wall Street actually is pretty good. I, I'd say that one. It's because it's, it shows you, it shows kind of like a up and down cycle of everything. So I'd probably say that one because it's, yeah. it kind of takes you on a roller coaster and shows you. Of the characters of the It really does. Characters. It shows you from, you know, a guy from humble beginnings to, <laughs> yeah. to, yeah. to a place and then, and then back down and just. That was that was what it was like in the eighties and nineties and the early days with some of those some of those people. So, mm-hmm. 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 what are your plans for your business in the next five years? Question. So, in the next five years, my plan is to continue to grow uh, organically my business when it comes to you know growing our clientele base, growing the team, and we want to continue to be that place where people want to go to get well rounded, holistic independent advice um if you're starting off if you're a mature business or if you just need some sound guidance that someone's actually going to tell you the straight good so we want to continue to be that that place for people to go and continue to grow our our team so Mm -hmm. if you can have dinner with any successful financial advisor businessman investor philanthropist in the world who would it be Warren Buffett. Mm. Uh, I was looking up Warren Buffett last night just to even see what he's doing at the moment. Yeah. And I like literally, that was, you could like look at my history. I was looking Did up you see Warren that Buffett. document? His documentary was very good. I haven't seen it. It's that. really yeah. good. Where is you it gotta on watch Netflix it. or? I'll send it Prime? to you. No, okay. I can't remember. I saw it's it somewhere else, I've seen it, yeah. It's, it's, it's good. It's really good. And, and for him, it's because he's been around for so long. Yeah. And he's been he around for like, literally decades in general he's like he's in almost 90 or in his 90s so i think he has so much wealth i mean there'd be probably some more i mean cooler ones and younger ones to talk to but i think for the amount that he's seen through his lifetime it'd be cool to see what he's seen on from his lens because he's sure. he's a guy that people have been looking up towards for decades mm-hmm. so so we added a couple more questions on but right. what's your latest gadget purchase under 200 dollars Oh, uh, one of those reading things, clearly. Uh, a what's... Kindle? Yeah. Yes. Okay. There you okay. go. Okay. okay. I haven't used it yet, but I bought it. <laughs> it's just sitting there. Basically. I was like, hey, Repurpose start... the gift, I guess? Or... I don't know. I bought the thing. I was like, I bought it a few months ago. I was like, this is great. I want to, I was just like, gonna... yeah, I was just, I wanted to do some traveling. I was like, oh, this is an easy way to kind of bring some books with me. And mm-hmm. I haven't, haven't even... gone away yet. I haven't done anything yeah. yet. And uh, I haven't had any books to it yet. So okay. There you go. Warren Buffett's book. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are not too far away from mine and Tony's brokerage. Mm-hmm. Let's tell our listeners where they can find you, um, social media, where you're located, and website. Sure. Um, so my office is located at uh, 4561 Hastings Street. So it's Hastings and Willingdon in North Burnaby. Mm-hmm. Um, my website is uh, mgmfinancial.com yeah. <laughs> sorry I, just had I a, forgot your name for a second, for a second like, uh, <laughs> so it's mgmfinancial.com uh, to reach me directly it's mike at mgmfinancial.com 
Um, we are all all the socials: Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, everything, everything mm-hmm. basically. Yeah, so please reach out. The best way to reach reach us directly is via email. So it's mike at mgmfinancial.com or info at mgmfinancial.com. Uh, and we have a pretty robust website that uh, has a lot of information on it that is continuing to evolve and, and grow every so often. We're doing updates all the time. So yeah, come check us out. Awesome. Amazing. Thank well, you for coming on today in person. Yeah, Thank you. in person too. Yeah, yeah. for Listen you listeners it. who are looking to have a complete holistic financial a uh, b- b- picture yeah. of your portfolio. Mike Molika is the guy to go to. You heard firsthand here that um, at every stage in your life, wherever you are, you definitely need financial advice. So uh, check out mgmfinancial.com. Thank you so much for joining us. See you guys soon. Thank you.